Hi, this is Keith Kaiser with another word of wisdom from the Gospel according to Mark. Today we're in Mark chapter 13, and the Lord Jesus is in that final week before the cross of Calvary. And this chapter is parallel to Matthew 24, what we often call the Olivet Discourse, because as verse 3 says that the Lord Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. But we'll start at Mark 13, verse 1. Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now we referred to this a few lessons ago, that uh, the people were very impressed with the temple, that not just Jews, but even Gentiles that would visit Jerusalem were very impressed with the stones and the workmanship and the grandeur of this temple. And there's something about human beings that being material people made out of material stuff, we might say, we're impressed with material wealth and material beauty. And to some extent, God has created us that way, that we have an aesthetic sense. We have a sense of beauty, a sense of art or design, and that is filtered different ways through the human prism. So in some people, it exhibits itself in the ability to draw or paint or to sculpt, or in some people it's craftsmanship, to work in wood or stone or metallurgy, such as in here. And even in the sciences, one can see that creative human impulse of scientists trying to discover how things work in the universe and how to make applications from the principles of the natural world to our everyday lives. So all of this kind of put in us by our Creator. It's sort of hardwired into us as human beings. And yet, when it comes to spiritual things, the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 4 that the, that God is spirit and He must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. He's seeking those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth, in fact, our Lord Jesus said. And yet it's so often the case that people forget the spiritual and they become overly occupied with the material. It becomes about the building. I can't tell you how many times I've been in large and impressive religious buildings. Sometimes I've been in some of these great cathedrals in Europe, and I'm always impressed with the fact that the way these buildings are designed is with a certain philosophical intention. In other words, these buildings aren't pragmatically designed for the purpose of giving you the best place to hear the Word of God, or even the best place to sing to God, because for centuries there wasn't much attention paid to preaching the Word of God. The Word of God was kind of a sideshow. It was pushed off in the Middle Ages in particular. The singing wasn't typically done by the congregation. It was done by monks, by kind of a semi-professional choir, if you will. And yet, you have these buildings that are massive, that have these huge vaulted ceilings and all these ornate decorations, and it has nothing to do with actually connecting you to God. The philosophy behind buildings like that is to make you feel small, and in some cases to intensify that feeling of mystery, that God is so much bigger than we are, and incomprehensible that we can't possibly know him. So we have to come by means of human priests and human churches and human organizations, and they put us in touch with God. Well, that is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible can be worshipped on a beach with no building whatsoever. He can be worshipped in a jungle, again in a hut. He can be worshipped in a storefront, rented in an inner city somewhere. He can be uh, worshipped in a very unpretentious building. And I'm not saying that we should intentionally build meeting places that are uh, intentionally ugly, let's say, but the Lord is the one who wants to be worshipped in spirit. And it doesn't matter how grand the building and how magnificent the artisanship and how beautiful the artwork that you decorate it with, if you don't worship the Lord on His terms, if you don't come by the way He's appointed, then it's of no value before God. You've missed the boat. You, you've been distracted from the main thing because the main thing is a living relationship with the true and living God. Now the disciples even were carried away with this beautiful temple. And yet the Lord had to tell them, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left on another 
that shall not be thrown down. And he was prophesying the eventual destruction, as I mentioned before in an earlier lesson, that the Romans destroyed this temple in AD 70, and that what the Lord said literally would happen. You can go to the Temple Mount today in Jerusalem, and you won't see not even a wall of that temple still standing. Uh, what you see is a retaining wall that was around the larger area, the grounds around the temple. It was a, an enlarged area that Herod had made to kind of increase the commerce and the tourism and, and make it a little bit nicer, I guess, to go up to that temple, in his mind at least. And you can go along, and you can even now today go in a tunnel underground and follow along those huge stones that go down to bed, bedrock. But that, again, is not part of the temple proper. That's part of the environs, the surrounding area of the temple. So what our Lord prophesied was literally fulfilled about 40 years after the event, a little less than that, uh, perhaps. But anyway, the Lord accurately predicted this, excuse me, decades before the time. And he begins to teach them then at another question. When they come to him in verse 3, he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. And this is a very historically significant place because when you read Zechariah 12 through 14, those three chapters, it's going to talk about the second coming of Messiah to earth and him coming in judgment and establishing his kingdom. And the Mount of Olives figures very prominently in that, that this is the place the Lord's coming back to. Of course, our Lord Jesus ascended back to heaven later from that mount, and this is the mountain he's coming back to in his second coming to earth. And here he's sitting on that Mount of Olives opposite the temple. So it's an appropriate place for them to talk about future events. In fact, to this day, the most prestigious place for a Jew to be buried in Israel, I believe, is on the Temple Mount. And you can go up there and you can see the tombs of uh, former prime ministers like Menachem Begin or uh, righteous Gentiles like Oscar Schindler and other people that are buried up on the Mount of Olives. They believe they're going to be raised first when Messiah comes uh, because they, they have Zechariah in their Bible, obviously. And so they recognize the importance of the location. But here, Peter, James, John, and Andrew come and ask him privately. Now, it's not the Twelve. Again, it's a subset of the Twelve. This is an intimate group. And it's been said that the Lord doesn't have favorites, but he does have intimates. You know, God's truth is available to every believer. If you know the Lord, the Lord wants to teach you uh, what his sacred secrets are, so to speak. He doesn't want you to be in the dark. In contrast to those architects who made the great Middle Age cathedrals in Europe and even Renaissance era churches and buildings in Europe, it's not the idea of making you feel like you're so small and insignificant and God wants to keep you enshrouded in mystery. He, he wants you to know nothing, you know? No, God wants to reveal himself. He wants to disclose himself. That's why he sent the Lord Jesus, whom Colossians 1 describes as the image of the invisible God. He's the very icon, in other words, of God. He shows us what God is like. He said in John 14, he that had seen me had seen the Father. So he wants to reveal truth. But the thing is, time and again, even in the Gospels, we see sometimes it's only a few of the disciples, in this case, a third of them, that are coming to the Lord Jesus to ask him to further elucidate his truth. Now, the principle could be wider as well, that the Lord would be teaching out in the public, as we saw with his parables in Mark 4, and then he's in the house teaching to his disciples as they come to him privately. So the public, a lot of them didn't come to him for further teaching either, didn't come to have him elucidate and give further instruction and explain what they had missed or what they were misconstruing. But even among the disciples, there were some that were closer to the Lord, that were more zealous to hear what he had to say and to learn what he wanted to teach them. And so these four were especially keen, and they were among the earliest of the disciples. And they're all uh, from this Galilean conclave of fishermen, one might say. So they say, tell us, verse 4, when these things be, and what will be the sign of when all these things will be fulfilled. So they want to know about when it's going to happen, that these things are going to occur, and what is the sign that it's going to be fulfilled. And the Lord's going to begin to tell them about the end of the age, which we'll examine in detail 
a little more detail at least, in later studies. Uh, but in essence, they wonder about the future. They wonder about when God's word is going to be fulfilled. And that, of course, uh, betrays a few presuppositions. Number one, it's the idea that God has prophesied what's going to happen in the world. And our Lord Jesus continues that. He continued to talk about the future and what would occur. Secondly, as a presupposition, it assumes that the Lord is in control of the world, that he's working out his purposes, that what he says he will also do. And that, of course, is true. And we're thankful for that truth of the sovereignty of God, because he's a good God with great plans uh, to fulfill, not only in this world, but even more great plans in the world to come. And then thirdly, the fact that the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, is totally privy to these plans, that he has omniscience, that he knows the future. He is able to speak with prescience, in other words, perfect foreknowledge, to know what's going to occur before it happens. And so they come to the Lord with confidence to have their questions answered. Now, when we look around at the world today, as much as at any time in world history, we might be perplexed as to where the world is headed. We might look at the countries in which we live and wherever that country may be, and we may despair and say, look at all the chaos around us. Look at all the trouble. Look at the lack of peace. Look at all the people that are in an uproar and outraged and hurting one another. Look at all the injustices. Look at the wars and rumors of wars. Look at uh, the crime. Look at the perversion. Look at people turning their back on God. Where is it all going to end? Well, the wonderful thing is we don't have to guess. We don't have to sit and wonder. We don't have to look around to the great nabobs and luminaries and the philosophers of this world and ask them to elucidate the future and tell us what's going to happen. They can't prognosticate perfectly. They can offer educated guesses, maybe. But unless they know the Lord personally and his word, they have no clue where this world is headed. And yet the Bible spells out for us where the world is going and the fact that it's going to culminate in the triumph of God, in all of his purposes being fulfilled. As the Lord said in the previous chapter, that every enemy is going to be put under his feet, going to be made the footstool of his feet. So we don't have to despair today. As believers, we can come to the Lord and prayerfully ask him the way these disciples did. Lord, teach me from your word. Teach me how to be a person to live in these last days. Because since the Lord Jesus came to earth and died and rose again from the dead and has gone back from heaven, we've now ushered in the final epoch of history. I'm not saying there aren't future prophetic things to occur. Yes, the future time of Jacob's trouble or the tribulation, as we often call it, that's going to happen. The future coming of Jesus to the earth to rule and to reign, that's going to happen, the millennial kingdom. I didn't mention the rapture. That wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. And that's something left mainly for the epistles and for Paul to elucidate for us. But what the Lord said will happen, he'll come again and receive us to himself. As 1 Thessalonians 4 explains, we'll be caught up to meet him together in the air. And how should we then live? What kind of people should we be? Well, the word of God is filled with the Lord's teaching on that. Both the teaching he gave in the Gospels and the teaching he gave through his Holy Spirit to the apostles, which they wrote down and their friends wrote down in the New Testament. And we have that teaching. So like Peter, James, John, and Andrew, we can come to the Lord and say, Lord, tell us about these things. And the Lord will tell us. Now he tells us certain things that he won't tell us. He says of the day and the hour of that second coming to earth, no man knows. So he's not going to tell us that answer. And we shouldn't go through treating the Bible like it's a, a book of puzzles or like, a, you know, one of those kind of things where you've got to decode it. No, uh, we can't figure out when the Lord's going to come, but we know the Lord's going to come. And he tells us to be watching, to be sober minded about this world, not to be beguiled, in other words, and not to think that this world is all that it, there is or that it's going to go on forever. One day, the Lord Jesus is going to break through the clouds. One day, he's coming back to earth to intervene. And so we want to be ready for that coming. And the word of God is going to teach us that in the meantime, we need to occupy till he come. In other words, be about the master's business. The Lord Jesus said in the Gospel of John that the night is coming when no man can work. We need to work before the night comes. 
So let us continue as his spirit guides us to serve him, to work for his glory, to build the church, to lead others to faith in Christ, and to build one another up as we grow in Christ using those gifts. May God help us today, even in these last days, to glorify his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening.